Okay, you are good to go whenever. All right. Well, thank you everyone for um, taking the time out tonight to, um, I know we've all had long days, but I appreciate everyone coming uh, to learn a little bit about the KIND Clinic um, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. Um, so just a little bit about myself. My name is Kate Nolan. I am a nurse practitioner um, in GYN Oncology at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and I'm also the founder of the KIND Clinic. The KIND Clinic stands for Kate's Intellectual Disability Clinic. I think it's a rather clever acronym. I did not come up with myself. Uh, my friend did, but I think it's it's rather appropriate for um, the clinic that I, I run at, at Beth Israel. Um, I'm also the proud sister to Elizabeth. Um, Elizabeth is a 37-year-old, um, and she has Down syndrome, um, and she's absolutely amazing. And this picture here that's shown here is just a, a picture of myself and Elizabeth, um, you know, just, just hugging it out and she absolutely gives the best hug. So she is, she is amazing and she, um, inspires me every day. Um, but she also inspired me to start the kind clinic at Beth Israel. Um, Elizabeth is, is healthy. Um, she, she has, uh, thyroid, she has hypothyroidism, um, and she sees her primary care annually, um, for routine exams, but her primary care as well as other providers always told my mother that, you know, she she's not sexually active. She doesn't have any GYN complaints. Um, she's, you know, her periods are normal. So why are we going to put her through getting a pelvic exam? Like that's going to hurt her. It's going to scare her. Um, and being a nurse at the time, I was, I, I paused and I was like, oh, this doesn't sound like it's, you know, appropriate. You know, she should be getting the same same care that I'm, I'm offered. Um, so, you know, I paused for a little bit and then, you know, I, I became a nurse practitioner in 2006. Um, and you know, one of my dreams since becoming a nurse practitioner was to start a clinic specifically for women with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, but I didn't have enough confidence. I, I didn't have enough courage. I like questioned myself whether or not I could really, you know, make this clinic happen? Was I, was I smart enough? Was I, could I just do it? You know, and I just, I didn't have the en enough confidence. Um, and then I was introduced um, to a adolescent GYN from Children's Hospital, Dr. Maureen Lynch, um, who is absolutely amazing and has become my mentor. Um, but Dr. Lynch, um, you know, she sees adolescent GYN patients and through the years in her almost 50 years of practice, a lot of her patients have um, do have intellectual and developmental disabilities. So they just kind of, you know, just happen to come into her clinic and she loves her patients that she sees and she's an amazing provider, but she was concerned about, you know, um, retiring and what she was going to do with these patients um, because she started, she started seeing them as adolescents, but then continued to see them you know, into their adult years because there wasn't a provider um, that could see them. So, um, you know, just in meeting Dr. Lynch and getting, you know, lots of words of wisdom and encouragement, you know, I, I was finally able to, um, you know, open the KIND Clinic at Beth Israel in 2019. Um, and, um, you know, Dr. Lynch is retiring this year, so she's been referring a lot of patients to me. So it's been absolutely, um, you know, wonderful to have her as my mentor and and to help me. So, um, yeah. So that's just a little bit about how kind of the kind clinic has has come into fruition. Um, all right. So as a lot of us know, I, I'm assuming I think a lot of us are OBGYNs on this call, but you know, puberty is unique to all, um, and this is the same for a woman with an intellectual and developmental disability as well. Um, you know, you can see in this picture, um, you know, there's a bunch of tweens and teens that are singing their hearts out and they're all at, at different developmental stages, you know, um, but they're all, you know, they all are, are the same. So yes, they are different because, you know, some have an intellectual disability and some don't, but in terms of, you know, gynecologic GYN, um, you know, puberty, they're, they all have the same thing. So, you know, puberty begins between the ages of 19 and 15, and that's pretty much the same for for a woman with an intellectual disability. Um, it might, you know, some sometimes 
Puberty might start a little bit later, um, but in general, it pretty much uh, stays the same, you know, regardless of, of someone's intellectual disability or not. Um, whoever's going through puberty, you know, like none of us want to go through it. It's gross. You know, we have a gross spurt. We're awkward. We're, we get breast buds. We get pubic hair. It's all just gross. And, you know, you're just scared about it. So what I do encourage, um, you know, family members and caregivers you know, when I've talked to, you know, pediatricians and primary care providers, I do encourage just, you know, let's not make it a big deal. You know, I think it's just, this is part of life. These are changes that our bodies are going through it and it's natural. So I feel like if we can just talk about it and not make it a big deal, um, you know, then when these things do, when your body starts to change, then you're not as scared to see the changes that happen. Um, so, you know, I just think it's important just to have an open conversation, you know, right from the get-go and that's to anyone with whether they have a disability or not. Um, so in terms of the HPV vaccine, I do recommend, you know, um, that women in the kind clinic do, you know, a lot of them come in already having the HPV vaccine, which is amazing. Um, but if they haven't received it, you know, I do recommend that they do get the HPV vaccine, regardless of if they are sexually active or not. Um, I just think it's, you know, it's a very safe and well tolerated vaccine, um, you know, and um, I do recommend um, that it's given um, to everyone, uh, regardless. So, um, you know, I always preface to all of my patients and their family members that, you know, my my lens is a little bit tinted because I do work in GYN oncology. So I, I see the worst of it. Um, but my hope is, is that we can that I can do anything and everything to uh, prevent, you know, any type of, of cancer from happening if I can, um, obviously. Um, the next slide is just, you know, let's talk about the periods. No one ever wants to get a period. It's disgusting. It's bloody. It's gross. I have to wear a pad. I have to wear you know, uh, period panties, like it just, I get crampy, I get irritable. Um, but again, it's, it's a natural part of, of becoming a woman, um, is, is getting your period. So, you know, I, again, I really encourage, you know, family members and caregivers, primary care providers, pediatricians to really just, you know, start talking about the period before it actually happens. So when it does happen, it's not the end of the world, because again, it's just a natural part of, of, of being a woman. Um, most caregivers or family members and or patients, um, do come into the kind clinic specifically to talk about how can I get rid of my period? Like, I, I just, I can't have it anymore. I don't want to have it. It's the worst thing ever. I'm having behavioral changes. You know, I, my seizure activity is, is worse during uh, my menstrual cycle. So, um, I do spend a majority amount of time, you know, on the initial consult talking about, you know, how to prevent a menstrual cycle or how to improve a menstrual cycle. Um, you know, I do have some family members or patients that still feel like it's a natural thing to continue to have a menstrual cycle, and that's absolutely fine. Um, but I do, you know, a lot of times do talk about menstrual manipulation um, in this in this population. Um, because again, you know, a lot of a lot of my patients um, have autism, you know, seeing blood, feeling blood, there's tactile issues, um, you know, that can cause some behavioral problems and or, you know, depression, anxiety. So um, if I can do anything to to decrease any of that for them and, and just, you know, manipulate their menstrual cycle, then we absolutely can do it. And it's healthy to do. So um, a lot of people think that it's not healthy to do. And as we all know, on this call, you know, not having a period you know, as long as you're on, you know, something preventing the period hormone wise, then it's absolutely fine to to not get it. So, um, you know, I, I use, you know, just continuous, you know, OCPs, um, estrogen progesterone pills. Um, I'll use, you know, progesterone only pills, um, a Mirena IUD, Skyla, Lyleta, you know, I do offer that. I find that a lot of uh, family members and or caregivers you know, the idea of the IUD sounds wonderful, um, but they get really concerned with, you know, is my daughter or client going to be able to tell me if the IUD hurts them or if they are having bleeding um, or if there's an issue, if it were to fall out. So that's something that, you know, I have a handful of patients um, that I, or have been seen in the Kind Clinic that, 
either came in with an IUD or have had one inserted um, that are that are very happy with it. But you know, it's one of those things that, and I understand that concern because a lot of my patients are nonverbal and um, they rely on others to kind of, you know, completely take care of them. So I understand that that um, that concern, but it absolutely is an option. Um, the depo Provera shot is also a, is a great option, but you know some of my patients are in wheelchairs, so if they're in a wheelchair, I'm obviously not going to um, you know give the depo, but it is another option that I offer. Um, Nexplanon, I have a few patients that you know that are happy with the Nexplanon. They actually came in with it. They I met them and they had already had it inserted. Um, my only concern with the Nexplanon is that you know as I had said before, I do have patients that you know, tactile issues of having to, you know, wear a pad or or period underwear is, is a concern for them. And it just, it can, you know, cause them to have some behavioral changes. So with the next plan on, you know, having the irregular uh, bleeding pattern, you know, might not be something that, you know, is, isn't, is good for them. Um, so it's all specific and individual to every patient, but, you know, um, I pretty much offer, you know, all of these options. My last option that I do, and I, I use it actually quite often is a Justin, um, because it's, it's well tolerated by patients. It eliminates their periods. Um, it's safe to use when a patient has, um, a seizure disorder, um, so, you know, and as I said, uh, you know, I do have a great, good handful of patients that do have a seizure disorder. So using the, um, North syndrome, you know, Agestin is something that is well tolerated, eliminates the period, you know, as long as the patient is not sexually active. I mean, if they are sexually active and I have them on the Agestin, um, then, you know, they will have to use condoms, um, cause it's not effective in preventing pregnancy. Um, but in terms of, of, of periods, you know, I have some handouts um, that eventually I hope to get linked to my website for the Kind Clinic. They're not there yet, but I made a handout just specifically talking about periods, you know, again, not making it a big deal, um, you know, practicing, you know, wearing pads and or, you know, the period underwear. I don't have any patients that wear a tampon, um, but, you know, obviously it still is an option. But I think, you know, what I really encourage my patients that can independently care for themselves is that they, um, you know, really track their own cycles. They have, you know, if they are getting them, um, they really, you know, whether it's on a calendar, whether it's through a period app that they can have on their, their iPhones or their, or their iPads. Um, but I really think it's important, um, for, uh, women, you know, regardless of an intellectual disability or not to be independent with their own, um, knowing when their own menstrual cycle is going to come. So, you know, and, and when they are independent with them, you, it's amazing how excited they get to know that I'm doing this on my own. Like I'm, I'm doing it. Like I am independent, you know, they get like this, like enthusiasm, which I think is amazing. Um, so I really work hard to really try to encourage, um, women in the kind clinic to really work towards independence if it's possible. Sometimes it's not possible and sometimes they partially can be independent. Um, but any independence that they can have, I think is, is, is key and just, you know, empowers them to, to want to just work towards more independence. Um, in that independence, just, you know, I encourage women that are getting their menstrual cycles to start wearing, you know, a pad a couple of days before they think their period's going to be due because who wants to have an accident and have, you know, a stain on their bottom or you're sitting down at your day program or at work and, and you stand up and you have, excuse me, blood in between your legs. Like that's embarrassing. And you want to try to avoid that. So just putting on that, you know, just in case pad a couple of days before the cycle, as well as a couple of days after, um, you know, just makes it so we have that just in case. So we don't have that oops moment that can, that can make one embarrassed and, and be, you know, scared and not feel confident with themselves. So, um, you know, I always say just pack your patients, work towards independence, consistency, routine, like nothing changes. It's like, you know, every time you go to the bathroom, you change your pad or you set an alarm on a, on a phone and they know when, okay, it's time to change my pad. Um, so then again, they're able to, to, again, work towards that independence, which I think is, is very important, um, to do. Um, the other thing is that we talk a lot about in the kind clinic is, is hygiene, you know, um, 
it's easy for, you know, someone without an intellectual disability to, you know, get in the shower and, and clean all their, all their parts from head to toe. But for someone, a woman with an intellectual or developmental disability, sometimes that's a little bit challenging, whether it's, it's physical challenges of, of getting into the shower or, you know, that maybe their arms or their legs are contracted or, um, you know, they may have vision disturbances or something. So, you know, I think regardless of, of what their, of their challenger may be, I think it's really important that again, we work towards independence, you know, a woman in the kind clinic may be able to take a shower independently and wash their hair and wash their bodies, but it might not be as good as say a parent or a caregiver, but I think it's important to at least allow them to try. Um, and each time they get in the shower, you know, they'll improve on, on what they're able to do. So, um, you know, I just really talk about routine, consistency, um, really making sure that, you know, they put on their deodorant and they change their underwear every day and they change their bra every day. So really talking about the importance of, you know, um, making sure their laundry is done. Because a lot of my patients, they live in a group home and someone else might be doing their laundry or maybe they're able to do their laundry, but someone might not be keeping a close eye on whether they're wearing the same shirt or, you know, underwear or et cetera. So I just, again, if, if a, if a woman is able to work towards that independence, I know it sounds, you know, um, you know, not like it's a big deal, but it actually is because when you feel clean and you look, you know, presentable, then you're going to feel better about yourself and you're going to have more confidence and you're going to walk with your held, head held high. So, um, you know, I just, again, I think it's very important. And I have, um, you know, a, a, a handout that I created. Again, I hope for it to be on the website at some point. The other thing I'm going to start doing is there's like, there's a thing called social stories where I can work with um, some of my patients um, and kind of make a story about, you know, hygiene and, um, you know, also make a story about going to get a pelvic exam. Um, but these social stories seem to really um, be helpful for um, just the population of, of people in general with intellectual and developmental disabilities to really learn about what they're going to be doing, say, at a provider's office. And then that's going to help to decrease some of their anxiety that they have. So um, that's something in the next, you know, I hope in the next like six to nine months, I can um, at least have one social story um, and then I'll work towards more. But it's just, it's something that the data is showing that it's it's well receptive um, and easy for, you know, persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities to watch. So it's something that I definitely want to get to be part of the Kind Clinic, which will be good. Um, the next thing is, you know, this is my sister Elizabeth, um, who's on the right, and her friend Maggie. Um, and as we all know, this is Beyonce, the lovely Beyonce that's on the left. And what do they all have in common? They all have the same lady parts. So regardless of your of someone's intellectual or developmental disabilities, lady parts are the same, and we all need to be taking care of um, ourselves um, and starting to get an annual GYN exam at age 21. Um, so, you know, it, as I said, you know, getting a pelvic exam, regardless of your disability is very, very important. You know, um, it's something that I feel like, you know, as I had said at the beginning of this talk, you know, there were so many providers that told my mom that Elizabeth didn't need to get a pelvic exam because she wasn't having any issues. So why are we going to put her through the pain? Well, guess what? She was my first patient. And the first time she had a pelvic exam, she was so scared. Um, but you know, she, she did it. And then, you know, subsequent exams, she's been like, Oh, Katie, that's easy. It's no big deal. You know? So it's like, you know, the more we kind of get used to doing something, then the more you will get comfortable with it. Right. So as we all know, doing a pelvic exam, who wants to have one, but it's, it's something that is a part of life. It's a part of being a woman. It's a part of staying healthy. Um, and I think if we can start doing pelvic exams, specifically on women with intellectual and developmental disabilities, then down the road, God forbid there is a problem, then they'll already be able to feel comfortable doing that exam in the office. Um, you know, there's been a, a few patients that I would just like to share their stories with you in, in terms of pelvic exams. You know, I have my sister Elizabeth, she started her exams in her thirties and 
you know, now she's getting one every year and she's doing great with it. Then I had a woman who was 25 who came to the Kind Clinic and she had a host of complaints from her parents, from abnormal bleeding to pelvic pain to bladder pain to vulvar itching to, I mean, you just name it. She had, you know, her review of systems was just everything was positive. It was pan positive. So with this patient, I could, she, I, her parents really wanted her to get a pelvic exam because they felt like there was something that I was going to see on the exam that I was going to be able to tell. And they, you know, came into the office. I tried to do the exam. The patient was petrified. She couldn't do it. Um, and then she had to go to the operating room to have an exam under anesthesia. Um, and everything was fine. She was, it was benign. So there wasn't, you know, anything that was wrong with her, but if she could have, you know, maybe tolerated the exam um, and started her exams a little bit earlier, then maybe we would have gradually worked towards her being able to tolerate the exam. The next, the next example, excuse me, that I have is a woman, um, she was in her 60s, has Down syndrome. Um, she's actually a patient of, of one of the surgeons that I work with, and she had postmenopausal bleeding, but she'd never had a pelvic exam because, again, she wasn't having any GYN complaints. She wasn't getting her period anymore. And then out of the blue, she started having pelvic, she started having bleeding. So she had to then go to the operating room, have a DNC hysteroscopy, get the results back that then showed that she had an endometrial cancer. And then she was referred to our practice at Beth Israel. And she then subsequently went on to have surgery um, and she had her cervix and uterus tubes ovaries removed. But part of surveillance for her endometrial cancer is doing pelvic exams every six months for a period of time. And she never even was able to tolerate a pelvic exam before. So we're not able to follow her for her cancer as well because she wasn't able to tolerate the exams. However, with a little bit of practice and a little bit of patience, you know, we've been able to slowly work towards, I'm able to insert one finger into the vagina. I'm able to feel the back of the vagina and I'm able to use a small little pediatric speculum and she does great. Is she scared? Yes. But after every exam, she's like, Kate, you should be very proud of me. I did this. So um, and I'm absolutely so proud of her. I'm proud of all my patients um, that are able to do these exams. So, um, you know, these are just a few of my examples of, of why I think with any any female, it's important just let's start the exams young. Let's get people used to them. Again, let's pack our patients. Um, when I first meet a patient um, and their family or caregiver, you know, we spend a lot of time the first appointment talking about what to expect during the exam. So I show them, you know, I use pediatric speculums, very tiny Peterson ones. Um, you know, I'll, I will, I'll show the, show them the speculum. Um, I'll show them how it opens. Um, I'll put a little bit of lubrication, you know, on my hand and they're able to, if they want, they're able to touch the lubrication. Um, I'll then show them, you know, what the, the cyto brush feels like, what the spatula feels like, you know, what a Q-tip feels like inside of their vagina. Um, and then I then show them, you know, what we're going to do. They're going to get into the stirrups. Um, if a patient can't tolerate the stirrups, then I'll just have them, you know, kind of just open their legs in a frogger position. Um, and we can absolutely do, do the exam that way. Um, and then we talk about doing a breast exam because I also do a breast exam every year on them as well. Um, and I'm able to kind of tell if a patient or family member is kind of like, hey, I don't know if I can do this. Um, or a lot of patients are a little bit hesitant, but I'm like, you know what, let's try it, you know, and then if we can't do it, you know, then we can't do it and we try it next time. So it's something that I, I take the pressure off of, of patients and their family members, caregivers, you know, and I say, whatever we can do today is what we're going to do today. And that's what we're supposed to do. And then if we need to come back at another date and we do it at another date, then that's fine. Um, you know, I do have patients that right from the get-go, they're like, absolutely not. You're not doing this to me. I'm not doing it. And I'm like, okay, well, let's just talk about it and let's see. And then majority of them, I'm able to do an exam. Is it the best exam I've done? No. But, you know, if I only can insert one little pinky inside of the vagina, the first appointment and get a blind pap smear, then that's what we do. And then next time, you know, hopefully we can do, we can get a better exam next time. 
Um, so, you know, I definitely always try to see if we can do it and I don't give up on it either. So I think sometimes it just takes some time for patients to wrap their head around the fact that this is what they're going to be doing. Um, and that's okay. So, um, it's again, just, I just, people will say to me, you know, what kind of training did you get to, to start the kind clinic or to, to be a provider in the kind clinic? And I got, I have not, I have no training specifically to this except I have a sister with Down syndrome. Um, I can do a pelvic exam and I have patience and a sense of humor. So um, that's pretty much, you know, my, my, you know, what I, what I can offer <laughs> um, in terms of, of training. But, um, you know, I, I, again, it's just, I just, I take, I can take the time and that's the thing. None of us have any time. So to see a patient that is in a wheelchair and needs to be transferred to a Hoyer lift or has, you know, a pump attached to them or has contractures or something like that, you know, that can, that can add more time to your, to your um, busy schedule and put you behind. But, you know, it's, it's one of those things that thankfully I have, I have the luxury that I can spend an hour with my patients for their first appointment. Um, and I find it very, very helpful. And then for future appointments are, are 30 minutes in length. And I feel like I can, can get things done in, in that time frame too. Um, if a patient is very anxious about the pelvic exam um, or has lots of comorbidities or um, I shouldn't even say comorbidities, it's just, you know, I know that they're not going to be able to handle a pelvic exam, whether it's behavior, whether it's contractures, um, then I will have the patients go to the exam room with Dr. Lindsay Sipen, who is a, a benign OBGYN here at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. And she has graciously, um, you know, offered to help me with, with my kind clinic patients because I don't have operating privileges. So I can't take the patients, um, for an exam under anesthesia, pap smear and STI testing. So Dr. Sipen has graciously offered to, to help with my patients, which I'm very grateful for that. Um, so she has taken my patients to the operating room, done an exam on them. In terms of, of the patients that are getting exams under anesthesia, you know, I just, I, I wouldn't recommend that they do that every year. Um, you know, it's kind of, we can base it on frequency of a pap smear, um, or we can base it on, you know, symptoms that they're having. Um, but we kind of, I just keep an open, open communication in terms of frequency of that exam. But um, it definitely is not something that has to be done every year. I also have given patients either Ativan or Valium prior to um, coming in for an appointment, um, which really has allowed them to relieve them of, um, you know, anxiety and has allowed me to perform an exam in the office. So that is absolutely, you know, something that definitely is, can be useful. Um, and in terms of patients that can have an exam in the office, um, I do recommend that they get um, a pelvic and a breast exam once a year. Um, the reason for that is I feel like, again, we're developing a routine, uh, we're developing a consistency, some trust. And I feel like, you know, patients, you know, get are very proud of themselves when they can say, okay, I did this again. I'm so proud of myself. Um, so, um, it's kind of funny. I had a coworker one day who um, said, I know when it's kind clinic day because I can hear you saying, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you, but I truly am proud of them. You know, it's, it's definitely, um, you know, something that they should be proud of themselves for too. So, um, and then again, in terms of pap smears, I just, I follow our guidelines and I start pap smears at 21 and then co-testing um, at age 30. Uh, in terms of, of STI testing, no one wants to think about it. No one wants to talk about it. Um, but this is a very vulnerable population. Um, and a lot of these women are, you know, nonverbal. Um, and, um, you know, I want to believe that there are really good people in this world. But unfortunately, there are people that do take advantage. Um, so I just regardless of of whether if someone is sexually active or not, I do um, just get um, just gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomonas testing um, annually on my patients in the kind clinic. And that's just as a just in case, let's just make sure that everything is is healthy and, and safe and that the patient is safe too. Um, for the patients, 
you know, that I can talk with about, you know, safety. You know, I always talk to the patient's family members, caregivers about safety. Does the patient feel safe, you know, in their group home? Does the patient feel safe at their home? You know, um, a lot of my patients will take a van to get to their day programs or their jobs. So, you know, how does the patient feel on the van? Do they feel safe? You know, if they live in a group home, are their roommates only females or are they males too? Um, so, and then we talk a lot about, you know, just if someone were to touch you in a manner that you did not approve of and you weren't consenting to, what would you do? So we have, you know, we definitely have conversations about that, you know, and I, I, that's, you know, I, I, if a patient is nonverbal, um, you know, then I will have those conversations with a patient or a caregiver. Um, but I definitely always want to check in to make sure that every patient, uh, feels safe. Um, and that we're keeping them safe too. Um, and um, so again, this is, you know, just another, these are clinics in the United States. There are, aren't a lot, you know, and these are the clinics that solely provide gynecologic care to women with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And, you know, um, you know, the kind clinic now is on that list, but, you know, it's something that there are a lot of providers that will, see patients that have, you know, an intellectual or, intellectual or developmental disability, and that's wonderful. Um, but, you know, I think it's something that, you know, from this list, we can see that there is, there is a need um, because, you know, this population is growing, is aging, and, um, you know, it's something that it is important to, you know, again, maintain that we all have the same lady parts regardless of our disability. So we need to make sure that we are we are providing the best possible care for, for this population specifically. Um, as we all know, menopause is, is a natural part of aging. Um, it's something that, you know, it happens to all women. Um, you know, I, women with intellectual and developmental disabilities, most likely as with puberty, will go through menopause around the average age of 51. Um, there are um, women with Down syndrome, though, their aging process is a little bit faster. So um, they may go through menopause a little bit earlier. Um, and they're also, you know, sometimes based on medications that patients have, may have been on, or if they've had, you know, an increased seizure activity as a small child, sometimes like they may go through menopause a little bit earlier, but it's something in the kind clinic that, you know, I, I kind of start talking about, you know, when women are in at, in their forties, um, that, you know, once you do not have a period for 12 months, you should be done. So if someone is, if I say I do have someone that's, um, on, you know, continuous, uh, OCP, or if they're on a Justin for menstrual manipulation, then, you know, I most likely will probably take them off of that, you know, maybe 52 ish, um, you know, 51, 52, you know, it, I can be, a, have a little wiggle room, but I don't just keep women on hormones, um, you know, indefinitely. So, you know, but again, I, I do, you know, really try to, um, you know, hone in on the fact that if you have not had a period for 12 months and you have any bleeding at all, regardless of what color it is, um, I need to know about it because this, this could be concerning as we all know. Um, again, I, my lens is a little bit, you know, tinted because I, I do work in oncology, but, um, you know, I always let patients know that and caregivers, family members, we go over all of the same, you know, um, symptoms that can happen in, in a woman with, without an intellectual disability, those menopausal symptoms happen in this population as well. Um, you know, what I've seen, you know, again, I haven't been doing this long, but um, what I have seen is that, um, you know, the behavioral changes, the mood swings, that's something that um, has affected a lot of patients in, in this clinic. So um, just working with, you know, caregivers and family members to kind of, you know, let's talk about different things that could be causing these behavioral changes. Let's modify things, you know, let's talk about better sleep patterns, um, so it's something that we definitely, um, you know, talk about those symptoms. I have started women on, on, you know, hormone replacement therapy, um, you know, for a short period of time and, and it was well tolerated. So that's something that, you know, it's that I will do in this clinic. Absolutely. Um, in terms of, of 
screening for breast cancer um, with patients in the Kine Clinic. Getting a mammogram, as we all know, is very, very uncomfortable. Um, no one likes to get mammograms because it really hurts. Um, but it's something, again, that we want to do to make sure that we keep ourselves healthy. Um, so for patients in the Kine Clinic, I will order just a screening um, you know, breast ultrasound. Um, it is not specific in, you know, it's not the best for picking up a breast cancer, but if it's the only tool that I have, then I will, um, you know, I have done multiple breast ultrasounds on patients. Um, and then, you know, if, if they do need a mammogram, um, then that might be something that I might need to do. They might need to do under sedation, um, or with a little bit of medication if they need to. Um, but, you know, in terms of, you know, breast, breast cancer screening, I do mostly rely on a breast ultrasound, but I'm always, you know, communicating with patients and family members that this isn't the, the gold standard for screening, but it's the only tool that we do have available. So therefore, um, that's what we're going to use. Um, in terms of a mammogram, if a patient has been in a wheelchair or it has been, excuse me, um, if a patient is in a wheelchair, um, then it just takes a little bit more, um, you know, communication and, um, you know, with the, with the mammogram text, because they need to, um, there needs to be two of them that are there. They need to have an extra time for, you know, the, this patient in a wheelchair, but every patient that the, the, um, mammogram machine is accessible for a patient that's in a wheelchair. They can lower it down, but they just need to have two texts, two to three texts that are available and they need, you know, a longer, you know, uh, appointment time in order for this to get done. So I have been able to do that successfully. It's just a bit of coordination and communication with, um, with radiology to get it done. Um, in terms of colonoscopy, you know, they, I do recommend, again, we just follow the standards. I follow up with all my kind clinic patients to make sure that they're up to date on any screening that they are eligible for. Are they seeing their primary care on an annual basis? Um, we talk a lot about, you know, weight is a huge, huge thing, um, you know, for this population. I mean, it's huge for, for women who don't have an intellectual disability, but for this population, you know, obesity is, is definitely common. So I try to spend, you know, a bit of time talking about, you know, just healthier lifestyles and exercise. A lot of them are involved in special Olympics or best buddies, which is great. Um, but a lot of them are not, and they don't do much of anything at their group home. So, um, or at their day program. So a lot of these patients will go to a day program and they kind of just sit around all day, you know, or they go shopping to the mall or they go to a food court. So I think, you know, um, you know, working with other, other, you know, caregivers and facilities and day programs to try to maybe think of some, some healthier options for them to do during their day program is, is something that in time I could hopefully work towards. But in the meantime, during their visit with me, we do talk about just general health in general um, and maintaining exercise and body weight and good heart health and, and all of those fun things too. Um, so this is just the last slide and it's just, um, you know, the Kind Clinic meets the third Wednesday of every month and it's at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, you know, right in Boston. This is the phone number um, to call to make an appointment. Um, Mari uh, Rivera Ortiz is an amazing admin that works with me in the Kind Clinic. So she's able to help to, um, you know, schedule appointments and, you know, order tests and do all that thing and just keeps me organized, which I appreciate her so much. And then, as I said, Dr. Lindsay Sipen is an OBGYN um, at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, who um, will take my patients to the operating room to, you know, perform an exam under anesthesia. Um, and I, I greatly appreciate her, um, you know, offering to do that for my patients as well. Um, and just lastly, you know, I, I, I do at some point, I really hope that, you know, we can you know, I can start working more with residency programs. I'm starting to work with Harvard medical students, which is amazing, um, that have shown an interest in coming to, you know, shadow and, and see some patients in the kind clinic. But I think that, you know, I know in my NP, you know, schooling, I didn't get any training. I think maybe there was like a paragraph that I learned about 
you know, I mean, we learned about some genetic stuff and all that, but, you know, there really wasn't any real focus or curriculum based specifically to learning <clears throat> um, about individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So um, I just, I hope with time that, you know, you know, schools, nurse practitioner schools, PA schools, medical schools, they'll have a bit more curriculum um, that is specifically for caring for, you know, people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, and I just, and I hope that, you know, through training programs that um, we can expose people more to this population because, you know, a lot of patient, people, providers, I should say, they don't have any exposure to this population. And it's, and it's, you know, it's something that it, it's, they are going to see patients who have an intellectual disability and it's nothing to be scared of. Um, and you just, you just treat them the same way that you would treat someone who doesn't have an intellectual disability. So, um, you know, I, as I said, I just hope through, through some time that we can start, um, incorporating more, um, learning and, um, option to, to shadow in the kind clinic, um, moving forward. So, um, that is it. These are my references. And thank you so much. Um, I hope that, you know, you, you got something out of this and, um, you know, if you ever have questions, concerns, you, my email is on the slide, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, now that we're on Epic, my email is a mess. So if I don't get back to you right away, I will get back to you. I promise. I'm cleaning it all up as I'm getting used to Epic, but, um, you know, just please reach out. Um, and if you have questions, concerns, if you have any patients that you would like me to see, I'm always happy to see them. Um, but, um, thank you so much for, for taking the time to learn about the kind clinic and I hope you have a wonderful day and night. Thank you so much. All right.